Radio show. Hello, everybody. This is the 25th hour radio show with Tom Harness from Harness Digital Marketing and my wonderful sidekick, my tag team buddy, maybe. Hint, there hint, wink, wink, yeah. nod, nod. Kevin Huntsberger. Absolutely. Kevin Huntsberger here from WSIL TV and my one, two, three cents, the podcast and blog. And Tom, you, you said tag team partner and with, with good cause because we have a former two-time WWE, WWF for the old school fans out there, tag team champion in Tito Santana. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, sounds like you guys have a, a pretty good uh, tag team going on uh, yourselves over there. Well, we're, we're known to be uh, partners in crime that most people, we're kind of synonymous with each other, but though I, I have to say that Kevin's got more experience on the wrestling side than I do. <laughs> There's got to be a leader. <laughs> I'm slowly introducing him, and actually uh, my uh, Tito Santana LJN action figure is watching over this interview as we speak, so I've been a fan uh, for many, many, many years, and this is a, an opportunity, of, uh, of an honor to have this opportunity to speak to you, so uh, again, we appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, let me just kind of start off with kind of the beginnings of your career. I know that you uh, went to West Texas. Um, and actually, were you classmates with Tully Blanchard or you guys met somewhere along the way? Is that right? No, uh, me and uh, Tully Blanchard and uh, the Million Dollar Man, Ted to be honest, we were uh, all three playing uh, know, at the same time at West Texas State. So, obviously, back then, I know that both Tully and, and Ted have uh, the lineage um, uh, with their parents being involved in professional wrestling. Did you have any kind of family background, or how did you then uh, make that crossover? No, I, I, I wasn't even a wrestling fan, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, Tully, I guess uh, I could the eye of uh, Tully's father, uh, Joe Blanchard, who was a promoter in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, my, I think probably my junior year, Tully started t uh, talking to me about uh, his dad thought that I could have a great wrestling career and make a lot of money. And, you know, I wasn't interested. I, you know, I was a football player and I enjoyed what I was doing. I, I wasn't a wrestling fan at all. So, uh, you know, it, it did interest me. Uh, and, and again, he brought it up my senior year, uh, and I, I had uh, signed with the Kansas City Chiefs, and you know I, I still wanted to play football. But after my first year uh, playing uh, in Kansas City, it got kind of ten weeks, and then I went and uh, finished the season uh, in Canada with the BC Lions, and then I signed uh, another uh, year contract, and I realized how tough you know playing football was going to be, and the career was not uh, very long, and. I started uh, thinking, ah, maybe wrestling's not a bad idea. So uh, that's what I told Tony. Okay, I got back in my, my first year from the BC Lions. I said, I want to play one more year. And then my intentions were just to do it in the offseason. Uh, I said, then I want to start training. But uh, you know, I started enjoying it. Uh, it became challenging. And uh, I just saw that the wrestler's career, you know, going on and the football player's career. So uh, I made a move. and. Well, thank God uh, everything worked out. You know, when you say that you th you, you look looked hard at uh, wrestling as an alternative to football, I mean, I, I can't imagine what football, you know, your body goes through with football, but I've been up and close and personal and seen some of these matches in the training, and i got to tell you, it looks pretty equal to me with the, the amount of time, commitment, and uh, what you do. So when you got over to wrestling, did you, did you still feel that same way after playing football? Well, uh, you know, the body, you know, went through quite a bit more abuse than, than, than in football. You know, in football we had padding, and, uh, we had the helmets, and you know, uh, you know, people didn't go up uh, to your knees in, in wrestling that, like they did, did in football. And you know, there's, you know, they all have their challenges. You know, wrestling and football. But uh, you know, I remember the first uh, couple of weeks of training, my entire body was black and blue. You know. Uh, and the grind, and, and you know, they just uh, back then, you know, me and Hulk Hogan and Mr. Wonderful and Brutus the Barber Beefcake uh, and B. Brian Blair, we were all breaking in with the Hero Matsuda in Tampa, Florida, a Japanese wrestler uh, in Tampa, Florida. And you know, they didn't make it easy. You know, you had to prove to them that uh, you were worthy of uh, 
being a professional wrestler. And you obviously got that opportunity. And then kind of in uh, the early 80s, early to mid 80s, when when Vince McMahon was kind of taking this whole thing global, uh, you were one of those uh, early guys that that jumped back over to WWF and uh, were part of the very first WrestleMania, uh, you know, two-time Intercontinental Champion. At that time, did you have any idea how big this was going to be? Because we were kind of on the cusp, you know, when when the the whole rock and wrestling connection started, the cartoon and the action figures, and I mean, it really exploded, and you were, you know, an early part of that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, anybody had, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure Vince, you know, could see a lot farther in the future than we did, but uh, I remember him telling us in WrestleMania 1 that uh, he put all, all the money he had in, in, into WrestleMania 1, I mean, he put all kinds of celebrities in and invested a lot of money, and he says, uh, this is break or make, and, and we knew that uh, Vince had gone bankrupt, you know, a couple other times in, in his life, uh, so, you know, before WrestleMania 1, you know, I'm sure he had an insight, uh, you know, where he was headed, but... You know, the rest of us, we were hoping, you know. Uh, I remember Terry Funk talking about uh, how professional wrestling, we weren't going to be doing the, the high schools and, and, and the little, uh, you know, uh, arenas anymore. We weren't going to be doing big, you know, nothing but big cities. And before you know it, uh, sure enough, uh, we were traveling all, all over the world and, uh, you know, it took off. And, you know, it, it wasn't an overnight thing. I remember when, uh, even after WrestleMania 1, uh, we were wrestling in Detroit and some of the big cities, and you know, it still really had taken off. And that's about the time that all of a sudden, you know, that the, the, the wrestling went crazy, and, and we get to the arena, and people were just lined up, you know, in circles, uh, uh, kind of like a, the, the theme parks uh, when you have to wait to, to get in. And, and you know, they had twenty thousand people in the arenas, and, and twenty thousand couldn't get in. And you know, it just it was on fire for several years, and. Uh, man, it was good to be part of that. So you mentioned WrestleMania one, and I gotta ask, what do you what do you think was the success? I, I mean, obviously, it was a multitude of things, but when you look back on it, what do you think just people connected with the most at WrestleMania one to make it go crazy? Well, I, I think uh, you know Vince McMahon is. There's nobody better than him. Uh, you know, uh, merchandising. And he was merchandising the heck up out of, out of all of us. You know, he he told us, you know, and we didn't believe it. You know, he said, you guys are going to be bigger bigger stars than the, than the NFL players. And, and then for a while, I mean, we were recognized all over the world. I mean, the, you know, the NFL, there were stars in their cities. And uh, we were all over the world. And people could recognize us because they, they could see our faces. So I, I believe it, it, it was... Uh, you know the timing was 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 really good because the talent that uh, that Vince gathered, you know, in WrestleMania one, the wrestling talent. I mean, uh, we were we were all schooled. We were all we all knew the business. We knew the psychology. We knew what we were doing. Uh, we knew we had to work. We only made money uh, with with the money that we drew. You know, we didn't we didn't have contracts, so you know we were working our butts off and. Uh, I think the whole thing, you know, uh, boiled over and, and you know, it, it caught on fire, you know, with the matches that people were watching, you know, as far as I'm concerned, were, you know, the best matches that uh, they had ever seen, you know, overall, you know, in, in, in a package and, and you know, it, it took off, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was unbelievable to be part of it. And. You were very loyal to Vince McMahon after returning uh, in 1982, and I and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you and Hulk Hogan are the only two that have the distinction of being a part of the first nine WrestleManias. What was it? Um, you know, and, and obviously your character kind of evolved through those years. You went from you know Intercontinental Champion, single star, tag teaming with Rick Martel, and then going on to the El Matador character. What was it that kept you? Uh, loyal to the WWF at that time? Well, I mean, uh, I know that, like, one of my best friends in the business was, was Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, and, and uh, uh, he got upset because of the, of, of the payoff and ended up leaving, you know, and the way I used to look at look at it, you know, I, I used to think, uh, 
if I go somewhere else, if I'm going to be making the same kind of money, at least of what I'm making now, and nowhere else could you go and make the kind of money that uh, that I was making in the WWF. So that was part of the loyalty, you know. Uh, it was to, to for the wrestlers and for Vince, you know. It was all a business, you know. And uh, I started making more money than I ever dreamed that, that I was ever going to make, you know, in any. Uh, form or fashion and, and uh, you know I just kept working hard uh, and, and I knew that hard work uh, well hard work is, is the reason that I stayed there as long as I did you know uh, I saw a lot of a lot of my friends that, that came in and went and, you know and, and I just uh, stayed you know and uh, but Vince told me you know one day that you know uh, the reason is because you know my hard hard work and uh, I never really had any disagreements with him your feuds with uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, Greg the Hammer Valentine, and Rick Martell are probably, and even early on with uh, Don Morocco, the Magnificent Morocco, when you won your first uh, Intercontinental Championship, those are really kind of the standouts to me as a, as a young fan watching you. Do you have any particular favorite matches, moments, opponents um, during this time period or even beyond that? Well, it, you know, I didn't have a feud. Uh, I don't know if you remember... Uh, uh, the, the angle that I had with uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine, uh, supposedly he, he tore my knee up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had surgery. Yes. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Wonderful uh, is the one that tore my knee up the night before. So Really? We, yeah. We were taping in, in Bradford and, you know, my carpet was torn. I, I walked in in, in, in crutches and uh, Vince was having production meeting because it was a TV day in Bradford, Ontario. And, and I went up to him and I said, look, uh, I messed up my knee. I, I can't go anymore, uh, you know, I'd like to, and I, I suggested for me to do an angle with Mr. Wonderful, because, you know, we, we really, he was the one that did it, and, and, and uh, I, I loved working with him, he was a great wrestler, we had a, a great chemistry, and, you know, they didn't trust Mr. Wonderful, so uh, uh, Scott, uh, the, the booker, uh, really liked uh, Greg the Hammer, so I ended up uh, taping up my, my knee really, you know, enough to where I could... Uh, get into the ring without showing uh, that I was really, you know, not able to do much, uh, and got into the ring and, you know, Greg attacked me and put the figure four on and, you know, uh, left me in the ring and they, they filmed the surgery and, uh, I remember it, that it, it turned out to be the longest, uh, the longest feud in the history of the WWF. I remember the the video. I remember the package of them showing uh, showing the surgery. Now that you said that, I remember the attack and everything. I didn't realize it was Mr. Wonderful, though. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny, Kevin? You talked about what your memories are of, of, of Tito Santana during that time. I got a guilty thing that I got to tell you, uh, and that is, for the longest time, I thought you were Ponch from Chips. I thought you guys were exactly the same people forever when I was younger. <laughs> Until I realized later on that it was two totally different people, but for the life of me, I had people. I, I was convincing people that you were Ponch from Chips forever when we were going back and forth. <laughs> well, I guess I, I, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Something else that I've always I've always wondered about because I think there are very few wrestlers who have this distinction, and I I think I'm right about this, but I, I don't know for sure. Were you ever? A bad guy. I feel like you were always a a, a good guy in your wrestling days. No, uh, I think uh, of the guys that made it big. Uh, I think me and Ricky Steamboat are the only ones that never uh, uh, were heels. Wow. Yeah, I, Ricky was the other one that I knew for sure had had never been a heel. But I I thought you were in that class as well, and uh, I think that that really uh, kind of says something about where you are today as well. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm. I taught for nine years, and this is probably my favorite part to talk to you about in the show, and that is you fulfilling your lifelong dream of becoming a teacher. And I got to tell you, kudos, because one, uh, having taught nine years, that's quite an accomplishment, not only to go to college for it, but to be a mentor and a role model. And how amazing was this to be able to, to fulfill that fantasy uh, or that dream to be a teacher? Well, you know, uh, I've been doing it for 20 years, and... Uh, when I got into football and, and, and then wrestling, I never thought that I was going to teach. It was my wife that, that convinced me to, to start because I already had the degree. You know, I graduated in four years, and and, uh, and the reason I went into teaching is because uh, you know I was Mexican American, uh, 
uh, migrant workers, and it was my uh, my eighth grade uh, uh, gym teacher who who uh, got me interested in sports, and I started playing football when I was a freshman in high school, and uh, I feel that he was a big difference in my life, and you know uh, he set me on the right uh, path, and you know I, I just knew how much that meant in my life, and, and I just figured, man, if I can, if I can do the same thing uh, for one person. You know, you know that would be very fulfilling for me, and, and I know that I've made a difference in 20 years. And a lot of kids, uh, uh, it, it uh, when you, you know yourself, when you're a teacher, you, you see some really sad cases and uh, kids that are looking for for love and looking for attention, and you know they have a horrible home life, and you know they're, they're giving you a hard time in, in the classroom, and then you find out what kind of life, uh, and then you can understand, you know, what, uh, the reason behind. It. A lot of these kids' behaviors, you know, and, and you know, uh, a teacher can make a difference. You know, uh, our, our uh, administrators tell us, you know, that uh, we are probably the only love that they see, you know, in the daytime. And then some of them go home to some miserable lives, and you know, nobody knows what they're living through. And they're getting some love from a famous wrestler. How cool is that? <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I never had a famous wrestler for a teacher when I was when I was growing up, so that's that's got to be amazing. So in twenty years, you have seen some amazing changes, probably in education. Um, more and more that it, from when I taught, it, it seemed to be less and less about the connections and those teachable moments that we we learn those teachable moments, and it seems to be focused on testing. What do you do to to you know obviously meet those those requirements, but also make a difference in some of these kids' lives? Well, it's you know you're right. You know uh, uh, I don't think education is is going the right way. You know uh, uh, all this testing and all uh, we have to set some smart goals, which is a bunch of BS that we have to meet here in New Jersey. Uh, Christie. Uh, uh, which I don't have a lot of respect for because he doesn't care too much for, for teachers. Uh, he thinks we're overpaid and, and, and uh, we're taking care of, uh, you know, and he, you know, uh, I wish he could uh, try to live with the kind of money that teachers make. Amen. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, you do what you have to do, you know. And, you know, when you're in the classroom, it's still the, the most important thing is, is uh, it, 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 it are the kids and, you know, trying to teach them as much as you can. But, you know, we're doing so much uh, the educators that has nothing to do with what we're teaching in the classroom, extra work that we do that, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, as fun as it used to be. You know, it's uh, uh, a, a lot of extra work that, you know, to me that, that that's taken away from us preparing, you know, our, uh, our lessons in, in the classroom. But, you know, teachers don't get into to, to the business to, to become rich. You know, we, we do it because, uh, you know, we, we all have our reasons for, for caring for kids, and, and you know, uh, uh, I, I think educators will continue to uh, to, to, to strive and, and to work hard to, to take care of the kids, but I think it's going to become harder and harder to find the educators, you know, uh, I think when hopefully the job market gets better, some of these guys, you know, some of these young teachers uh, that are pretty intelligent, you know, are going to figure out that, you know, they can go somewhere else and probably don't have to work as hard, uh, you know, and make a lot more money than, than uh, teachers do. You know, teachers have the most amazing stories, and I, I, and I hope I don't call you on the spot here, but is there any story, and I know you can't use kids' names, but is there any story in your 20 years that sticks out as one of those those moments that you're going to be like, and on, when you retire and you're like, this is one of the stories that's going to stay with me forever? Uh you know, I, I had a a kid in a wheelchair this past year uh, that you know he, he had a hard time pronouncing words and you know and, and uh, at the end of the school year he told me you know uh, how, how great it was he says you know he says I, you know and he's like I had never had a professional wrestler as my teacher you know it was great you know and, and you know it, it just for him, you know, and I, and I never knew that, he, that professional wrestling, you know, was even in, in his life, you know, uh, was maybe in a professional, but all along, you know, uh, he was happy to be in my class because, you know, I was a professional wrestler. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe kids look up to me, you know, uh, 
and 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 I know that I know I'm a good teacher, and I know that it comes across. The kids know that I that I sincerely care about them. You know that that uh, the way I treat them. You know I I, I don't I, I never had any problems in the classroom, and that's not because I'm big or anything like that. It's just because of the way I treat the kids. You know I treat the kids with respect, and you know I expect them to you know respect me, and you know that's the way you know my classes go. You know I tell them. Uh, I respect you. I, you know, just treat me the way I treat you, and it, it works. You know, the kids know if you, if you care. You know, it comes across the way the way you teach and the way your mannerisms in the classroom. And uh, you know, for the most part, I would say ninety nine percent of the time, you know, things start pretty good in the classes. What's tougher, being in the Royal Rumble or in a classroom full of teenagers? <laughs> well, you know. It, it, I think in the classroom, you know, because there's always one that, that, that are going to test you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you have to figure out, you know. I, I remember the, the, you know, I don't know if you guys have time for the story, but sure. when I started out as a sub, I went into a special ed class. Uh, and there were seniors, and I get in the classroom, and, you know, I had just started, you know, so I had been away from education for, you know, quite a while. And, and, and these three guys, you know, I guess they, they said to themselves, Let, let's uh, let's get on, the, you know, Mr. Solis. And they started making animal noises, you know, pigs and horses and cows. And, you know, and they thought they were being cute. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm acting like I'm looking at the lesson plans. And then I get up and uh, I, I shut the door and, and, I, and I go to the back of the room and I pointed the three guys out and I said, you you know, I'm thinking, how the heck am I going to figure this out? Because uh, they don't prepare you for that. So I said, go to the front of the classroom. And they said, why? I said, because, guys, I said, you, your sound effects are fantastic. <laughs> I said, but now I want you to, you're going to have an audience. And, you know, I, I, want, I want you to give, give me some more sound effects, you know. And, and then they got embarrassed. I said, okay, sit down and, you know, stop. And, and, it, and it worked, you know, but, you know, the, the situations that you put into it, uh, I mean, you only learn through experience. I'm sure you had a few experiences yourself in, in, this, you know, in the nine years that you were in it. I've got a book ready to go. And if I have a book, then you must have a whole series, like a, a, a Harry Potter series in 20 years. <laughs> Are you still getting in the ring and, and lacing up and wrestling from time to time? Because I know over the last 20 years, I know you made a couple of appearances with WWE, obviously when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, uh, an overdue honor for sure. And then I know you wrestled a couple, t or at least one time with WCW uh, against Jeff Jarrett. So are you still active in, in the wrestling world too? Well, once in a while, not the WWF. Uh, I don't have much to do with the WWF, uh, you know, because uh, uh, whenever they have their pay-per-views, you know, there are Mondays and you know, I'm a school teacher. And, you know, I, I just... I just can't take time off uh, to go to a to a WrestleMania and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I do stuff on the weekends. I, from time to time, I do a fundraiser, uh, small wrestling shows. Uh, but I do do appearances. There's a lot of comic cons going on throughout the country, and uh, I, I, you know, we're considered legends. And, you know, we're big names, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of my friends uh, have passed on. So you know, there's fewer and fewer legends left. Uh, Every year, so we're in demand. So I, I stay as busy as I as I want to stay. You know, uh, I, I still enjoy going out there and you know meeting meeting the fans and signing autographs and taking pictures and and listening to the stories that they that you know why you know Santana uh, you know made a difference in, in their life and what some of the matches that they remember that you know that were a big part in in their lives and you know it, it just doesn't get old. You know. Uh, uh, I, 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 I miss the cheers, but uh, I don't miss the traveling. We used to work <laughs> like dogs. We used to wrestle 350 days a year. Yeah, and, and the holidays too. You guys were, you didn't really get a break. No, because, you know, we were entertaining. You know, uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's, Thanksgiving. You know, we were, we were always on the road to entertaining the people after they hit dinner they'd come out and watch, watch us wrestle. I don't care who you talk to. Anybody who compares the wrestling, you know, from my era... And now they all, everybody always says, you know, we we like the wrestling in your era so much better than, than, than now. 
uh, and, and it's because you know we were better wrestlers. We we, we had more ring psychology. We we learned from uh, guys that were better than us, and you know we were taught ring psychology. And unfortunately, these young guys don't have the the old vets that can teach them. You know uh, the ring psychology, and, but it's not the ring psychology is not important anymore because it, that now that you know they get a script and. Uh, this, they get a script on what they have to say, and they get a script on the match. So, uh, you know, it's not the same. We used to wrestle from the heart, talk, spoke from the heart, and, uh, and it was that lib. You know, we, we, we didn't practice the, every move, you know. It just happened. We, we told a story in, in, in the ring, and, and, we, and we included the fans, you know. Uh, the fans are the ones that helped us uh, tell the story. I remember Mr. Fuji, what? One of the things you have to learn, uh, Tito San, he used to call me Tito San, is you have to learn to listen to the people and, 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 and timing. And I used to say, timing? He says, yeah, there's a time uh, for everything. You know, uh, you can throw one drop kick and it's at the right time. It's, it's better than throwing 15 drop kicks. It, it means more. Uh, and there's a time when the, when, when the good guy starts to come up and starts showing the fire and stuff. And, you know, uh, that's ring psychology and... and, and you, you bring the crowds, the crowd in, you know, to you set the crowd up to, to, for them to start hollering, Tito, Tito. And, and you know, these young guys, they don't, they don't have uh, the knowledge of, of how to get from step one to step two to step three. And, you know, it, it, it's a lost art. Well, and, 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 and you don't need that art anymore, you know, because uh, it's not important to, to be, a, you know, a great wrestler in the ring anymore. I agree with all your points about it being a lost art and, and you know, it's it's way too scripted nowadays and, and way too regimented. But, uh, you know, I, I believe I'm glad that legends like yourself are still around and, and still able to meet with fans and, and, and spread these stories and, and, and let us know that, uh, you know, let us thank you for the contributions you made to uh, our childhoods. Well, thank you so much for, for having me up, having me on because, uh, uh, this will reach out to a lot of the fans, and, and uh, I do hope that it turned out. Uh, you know, I, I always, you know, thank the fans because if it wasn't for the fans who I mean, always, always supported me, uh, Tino Santana would have never gotten anywhere. So, uh, thank you. Well, thank you for joining our show today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, that was it. Tito Santana, WWE Hall of Famer. And I, I was going to ask for the Ariba, but I wasn't <laughs> sure if I should. So I, he organically did that, and I thought that was pretty cool. So I have this feeling that you're going to section out that Ariba, <laughs> and that's going to be a new ringtone for you, possibly? <laughs> it possibly may be. Absolutely, yeah. Tino Santana, we were talking before we started recording, always loved him, thought he was, uh, you know, like I said, he was one of the true good guys in the wrestling world outside of the ring as well, and, and never uh, turned heel. That's a bad guy for those who... Uh, maybe are listening to the 25th hour that don't know wrestling terminology. A heel is a bad guy. Tito, always a good guy, always on the up and up. Which I didn't know that about him. And I think, that, again, you mentioned this in the interview about how that speaks to his character. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that was by his design or choice or if that was just how, you know, McMahon wanted to, wanted his character to go. And he evolved into a couple of different characters. And, and I... And we didn't talk about this, but I thought he was the uh, El Matador. Yes. I thought he was the El Matador, which I loved that. It was pretty amazing in his stature. He, Yeah, and I think I think they actually, and I wish we would have had more time with him, but I do think that he was sent off to do some training in that, in that sport. I don't know that he actually got in with the Bulls, but I do know he worked with professional Matadors at one point. Which doesn't surprise me based on the interview that we had with him talking about how he really took the, the, the art form serious and how he put everything in. He worked. He talked about how his work ethic was to make it the best it could for the people. Absolutely. Well, Tom, it's uh, coming to an end here for us with the 25th Hour Radio Show. Always a pleasure to fill in for host Rob Fairless. Yeah, he's amazing. We are very fortunate that he allows us to get these wonderful interviews and uh, also to feed your wrestling fix. That's right. Absolutely. This uh, will be a part of my one, two, three cents as well. But Rob, uh, the usual host here on the 25th Hour Radio Show, trust us every once in a while to take over the reins as well. Rob, we thank you for that. We thank you all for listening as well. For Tom Harness, this is Kevin Huntsberger. This is